If you're wondering about Friday, well, Friday is Trump Week. That's T-W, Trump Week, W-E-A-K, Trump Week. Okay, Tim Apicella. Good morning. Cynthia Sinclair. Good morning, Good morning guys. Yeah, a big week. You know, it's like every week is a bigger week than last week. So let's try a, a track on what has happened this week, what comes to mind first. First, and this is the title of our show, Good, We're Not at War. We should be so happy we're not at war. But had we been at war, it would have been entirely of his making. He created the, you know, the problem, and then to solve the problem, he was going to go to war. But somehow it stopped, and he made himself a hero. Is he a hero, Tim? Not a hero. He lied, bold-faced lied. In, in, in What's the lie? Of, the lie was that they had authorized this, this attack, and at the last second, he said, well, how many people are going to perish, or how many people are going to die? And they said, we don't know, but we'll find that out. And they came back, and they told him 150. And he thought of the term proportionality of a drone being shot out of the air versus the deaths and lives of 150 Iranians. And he chose humanity. Well, first off, we know for a fact that when you get your first assessment about any attack, you know what the collateral damage is going to be, the direct damage is going to be. All those things are known and reported up front. So he knew that up front. He knew how many lives were going to be, you know, would be most likely killed. And 150 probably light. But the bottom line is, he made the story up. He made it up. Yeah. They came to him, my, my guess. They came to him and said, wait a minute, Trump, you can't do that. You're going to have collateral damage. You're going to have, you know, I don't know, 1,500, 15,000, 150,000, who knows what number. The, the 150 is made up. Um, and, uh, and they prevailed on him, you know, and I'm happy they did that. But I doubt that he controlled himself because he has no self-control. He would have been just happy as, as punch to do this. What are your thoughts, Cynthia? I don't believe he cares enough about human life to care, to worry one bit about 150 people. That was not behind his reasoning to say, I'm going to stop this. I don't believe it at all. I'm with him. We all ought to be taking a, a deep breath on this because... Mm -hmm. Whatever his apologies, or regardless of his statements about proportionality, which I can't, he, he can't spell that. Um, you know, the reality is we were close to war. The reality yes, we is we were an inch away, seconds away. Uh, and that guy, you know, he doesn't mind. And, and Bolton, you know, the two of them, they don't mind starting a war. We were close, man. And, uh, you know, this is going to happen again. Well, yes. look at the thread. Remember many, many months ago we were talking about um, the fact that Mattis, General Mattis, and uh, John Kelly were no longer going to be serving as bookends to keep him contained on the world stage, and particularly over the Iran, uh, Iran issues and Venezuela. We knew that the, the departure of those two gentlemen was going to lead to something, and here we are today. Here we are. Right. And you know what? That configuration that we saw a couple days ago, it's the same now. It's not essentially unchanged. So this whole affair could be repeated Again and again, uh, well, all it, all it takes is one bad time, and you have an unknown conflagration. Uh, he doesn't know that word either. You know, I, I agree. Yeah. I think, you know, Bill Weld was um, quoted as saying that he used to work with uh, Bolton at the DOJ, and that he finds him to be the most aggressive person he has ever met. Well known. That's why Trump hired him. Yeah. But look at the statements Donald Trump made regarding this, or just before this action, is, okay, Iran made a very big mistake. That's in reference to the drone that was shot down. Now, mind you, it was a $100 million drone. It wasn't, you know, just chump change. It was a lot of money. No lives involved. No lives involved. And then he said, You'll f we will find out. You will find out. So he made that, and no sooner did he make those statements, he said, I find it hard to believe that it was intended. Or someone loose and stupid made that decision to do that. So here he is, he's threatening them to say, no, nah, it was an accident. So there, look at the dichotomy of statements and, and, and just this split personality on, on, on foreign policy on the world stage. Hold that thought, because that's really a big thread for our discussion. But let's talk about another thing that, um, oh yeah. So the Cyber Command, which is in Virginia, I think, part of the Army, I think, it's like a separate command. Mm -hmm. Um, was found to have been hacking the Russian electrical grid. Uh, and that, I don't know where it came from, but when the New York Times called them to confirm the story, they confirmed it. 
They confirmed it, and they didn't say anything about how this was a big secret. Okay? The Times, if you remember three or four days ago, uh, published the story about how the American military was hacking into the Russian grid. This is breaking you know, the, uh, the deterrence factor uh, that we've had, we've enjoyed for the past few years on, on hacking, you know, and state, nation state hacking. Uh, and this could lead to really bad things, what they're doing, um, and making it public. But the Times reported what, what, what they found. It was their job. So Trump went after them, called them traitors now. So it's not enough to say war on the press, enemy of the people, fake news, which he's been doing since his campaign started in 2015. But it's now treason, treason in the Constitution. It's a very serious crime, punishable by death. Okay, he's calling the New York Times traitors. That is the biggest attack yet on the First Amendment. Well, a couple of days ago, he threatened uh, the Time reporter in the, Oval, in the Oval Office. There was, I believe, four Time reporters um, doing an interview in the Oval Office. And he showed um, the document, the letter from Kim Jong-un. And he said, okay, this is off the record. I'm going to show it to you. And apparently one of the reporters took out his phone camera. And I don't know if he took a picture or was attempting to take a picture. Um, Sondra said, no, you can't do that. And so that was the end of it. And then as they're asking him about whether or not Jeff Sessions was instructed to, you know, go, up, go light on the investigation and the testimony, he brought this thing up. He said, you know, I could jail you. I could jail you just, you know, to let you know that you tried to do something you shouldn't have. Yeah, maybe some jail would be good for you. He said, quote, you make some friends in jail. I mean, my God. This is the president of the United States. It's more like a worm. So what do you think, Cynthia? <laughs> about which part of all that? Because that's a lot to unpack. Let's talk about the First Amendment part of it. The First Amendment part, well, that's the part that is, I think, the scariest. We have death threats going out to so many journalists right now. And instead of saying this is part of our democracy, a free press, he's doing just the opposite. And he's doubling down and putting all of our, all of our um, you know, reporters out there in more danger, which I think is wrong. But then I think a lot of the story so, he does is wrong. A.C. Salzberger, the publisher of the New York Times, you know, got on, uh, this is interesting, uh, on Murdoch's uh, Wall Street Journal yesterday. <laughs> and it's a long article about it. From the New York Times on the Wall Street Journal. Not on the New York right. Times, but on the Wall Street Journal. <laughs> he also got on, got on national public radio and said, you know, we really can't tolerate this kind of thing. Uh, he calls us all these names. He's, he calls us the failing New York Times. And we're okay with that. Because as a matter of fact, all his Michigas, you know, that craziness, all his Michigas has actually made the New York Times very profitable. Yeah. More prosperous than... And before. the Washington Post. And the Washington Post. <laughs> and they're doing a good job. Uh, and they're free reporting fairly. Um, but when he calls the New York Times, uh, the failing New York Times, uh, Salzburg says, eh, it's okay, you yeah. can call me that because we're not failing. My P&L is looking better. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> anyway, I mean, that's how, yeah. that's how upset he was, that he would go to another media and publish his story. And the other media, two of them that I know of, the uh, you know, uh, uh, Wall Street Journal and, and uh, yeah. NPR, both. Yeah. So we have a crisis on the First Amendment, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and by the way, let me say that there's another part to the First Amendment that came up this week, and that's the Establishment Clause, the separation of church and state. So there was a, it was a decision by the United States Supreme Court, which departed previous uh, precedent, said that a cross um, commemorating something in some community somewhere, I forget where it was, was okay, even though there were people who, who who sued to have the cross removed. Um, and that, that's really disturbing because the, the, um, it, was, it was not a unanimous vote. Uh, and uh, Sotomayor and um, uh, who's the other little lady judge? Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Ruth Bader Ginsburg wrote dissents. Kagan did not write a dissent, which mm -hmm. is interesting. Um, but what, you know, what, what troubles me about it is that there was a long line of cases that you can't, put yeah. not on government property with government money, which is the case. Right. Uh, you know, we do have that establishment clause, but it has been eroded from the time of Bush, Bush the two, um, you know, or, or before. Oh, Ronald Reagan, I think, really tried to get yeah, right. that unraveled. Right. Yeah. And so, you know, what happened now is the United States Supreme Court reversed the precedent that has existed for all these years. 
And what, what they said, I forget who wrote the opinion, what they said was, uh, it's old. This cross is old. It has historic wow. moment. Give me a break. How do you define old? You know, that's 100 years. Well, how about 90? How oh. about 80? How about 50? How about 30 or 20 or 10? What's old? So, that, you know, they just crushed the precedent. And now we, we have another huge blurred line between church and state. Which creates conflict amongst the people. Yeah. And divisiveness. It's divisive. Conflict is divisive. Yeah, yeah. it is. So, Can uh, I just tag on to that New York Times um, article about the, the grid attack? Because I think the, it was a huge First Amendment issue and a, and a story on that. But what was the underlying issue? And that is someone in the CIA or during the briefings either chose not to let him know this was going on or they told him that it was going on and he still went uncorked. So either or, it's not a good situation. Right. And I think they, told, they chose not to tell him about this. Either way, terrible. Yeah. It means he's not in touch with his own intelligence community, but we knew that yes, we a long did. time ago. <laughs> we knew that when he ran him down in front of Putin. We, he, and he's done that so many... Oh, anyway, I mean, it's no surprise that the intelligence agencies are over here and he's over there. Well, remember, and the twain do not meet. Mm -hmm. Remember, just after the election, he invited a couple of the Russian diplomat into his Oval Office and bl blabbed out you know, some, some secrets that he wasn't supposed to, to release. And I think we're back in those days where no matter what he hears, they say this is confidential, top secret, top secret, top secret, uh, it still comes out of them. And yet, and yet there are people who still support him no matter what happens. I, um, I want to I cover one more thing before our break, and that's uh, the, the, the clean energy. You know, uh, Obama uh, initiated, I guess it was without statute, it was an executive order, a program about clean energy. And, and really, he was a little behind on that. Should have done that earlier. I mean, look at the state of Hawaii. We've had a clean energy program for, oh gosh, uh, 15 years now um, or more. We, we were early in, yeah. in, the, in the history of clean energy. Um, but now Trump has replaced the clean energy program. He's thrown out Obama's clean energy program and replaced it with coal, good old fashioned coal. So we're, we're going back, you know, at high speed and think about what that means for climate change. In, incredible that he would do that. And, you know, that may not be top, top story on the headlines, but there it is. And it's, it's, it's emblematic of his attack on the environment, of his attack on clean energy, yeah. his attack on climate change. Again, you see it. It's always peeking out at you. Um, you know, the attack on the auto industry, the CAFTA standards. There it is, same thing. You know, and, and even the automakers are going, no, we, we don't want to do this because California will have its high, you know, high clean standards, and we'd have to roll back to this, and we can't make, you know, multiple different cars. You know, it's not efficient. It's not profitable to do so. I think we need to take a minute on this, you guys, and try to figure out what makes him do this and see if we can come up this week as opposed to all other weeks. <laughs> with some rational explanation. And when we get back, we will each offer our own thoughts on that. Right. We'll be right back here on Trump Week. Aloha. I want to invite all of you to Talk Story with John Wahei every other Monday here at Think Tech Hawaii. And we have special guests like Professor Colin Moore from the University of Hawaii, who joins us from time to time to talk about the political happenings in this state. Please join us every other Monday. Aloha. I surrender, I surrender. All right, pal. Get ready for the day, buddy. Hey, Dad. Hey, Dad. Do we have a gun? What's up? Do we have a gun? Okay, we had a minute to think about why he does these bizarre things, things that he knows are totally provocative to a good percentage, if not the majority of the country, that make him look like a fool and a clown overseas. Why does he persist in doing this? Is it, does he think that uh, the, the base likes it? I don't know if that's true anymore. 
I mean, it was, for example, uh, there was a couple of articles about how, oh yeah, the Senate didn't, you know, a lot of people in the Senate don't agree with him on selling arms to Saudi Arabia. Uh, they're disaffected with his program. Um, the, the farmers, you've seen articles about the farmers in Indiana Midwest, they're disaffected about his tariffs. They're getting crushed economically. Um, so is it, is it the base? I'm not sure it is the base. Why does he do this? To provoke people here and everywhere. What's, what is wrong with the decision process? It's inherent within Donald Trump. It's part of his organic makeup, um, whether it be through sleep deprivation or some other non-defined psychological issues. I mean, it's inherent within Donald Trump to act like this. I don't think it's a strategy. I used to think, boy, he's a great strategist here. He's not. This is who he is. Talk about an example is the Iran, you know, near, near missile launch here. It didn't happen. It was irrational. It was irrational. And unnecessary. So to answer your question, it's a rational thought process that he's constantly up against in, well, within himself. But you know, if he gets away with stuff, he's, he's like any pathological person. He's going to redo it and worse. He's going to double down and he's going to show us how powerful he is and strong. And we are going to pay a price. So, okay, we got away from war here this week, but it'll happen again. And, and uh, so he succeeded, um, you know, in putting coal back on the table. Mm -hmm. um, he's going to do more of that. He's going to dump on climate mm -hmm. change. What were your thoughts? I think he does it because of money. I think he's had a lot of big mega donors, you know, just, you know, working over the money for his campaigns, all of his stuff. And he is beholden to them now. And so the now he has that. to do this stuff so, because he's beholden to them. He's beholden to the Saudis. He has to give them stuff, whether our Congress says no. He has to. I think he plays into all these big oil money people because they gave him money. Coal people, same thing. That's what he's all about. And he, so partly his base and partly because of the people that he owes money to and that have, you know, fueled his money so far. And the, other, the other thing just popped up in an article I saw recently. It's, it's the kitchen cabinet kind of thing. It's unofficial people who he relies on for advice. Right. They are really bad guys. They're immoral, unethical guys. But that's who his little kitchen cabinet is. That's where he's getting a lot of this mm -hmm. from. Kitchen cabinet and formal, formal cabinet. And that is the power of, if you think about it, the power of acting positions. Never really confirmed with the Senate. They're always acting. And if that one doesn't work out, I'll get another acting position in there. Yeah. And as long as they're loyal to me, um, that's fine with me. Okay, let's talk about something. You put it on your list first, and, and that was his, uh, the rollout of his new campaign. Right. Shades of 2015. Yeah. Shades of 2015. It was exactly like 2015. Yes. Yep. Um, the wall, the Clinton emails, winning. You're going to get so tired of winning. Um, this was my favorite, though. I'm going to clean out the swamp. That came up again. Really? Yes. Oh. And but he, forget, he forgot to mention that there's 182 lobbyists that are now working in the administration. That's cleaning out the swamp. Lobbyists in the administration? Yes. Former, former coal. Andrew, coal. Andrew Wheeler is the guy. He used to be a coal. Oh, you mean formerly yeah, lobbyist. Yeah, lobby. former lobbyist now in the administration. So now I, can't, the I can't think of 182 reasons why cleaning out the swamp Yep, see, I want to tell you. <laughs> in fact, lobbyists have spent $3.4 billion in 2016. I mean, so the number of dollars that are being spent by lobbyists to gain access and influence right. within our government is greater than ever. So whoever is advising him on the campaign, or maybe nobody even himself, but, uh, you know, is going through the same playbook. If it worked last time, it'll work this time. Uh, you know, the idea of, of, of going, uh, going hunting for uh, Hillary Clinton is so ridiculous. It's ancient news. It doesn't matter. But it worked last time, so he's pounding on her again this time. That's so absurd. I, I, I hope somebody in the base understands how ridiculous that is. Okay, let's go on. Um, we talked about uh, foreign affairs and diplomacy. In a few days, we're going to have the G20 in Osaka, and he intimidated uh, Xi Jinping to coming. I mean, I, you didn't think that Xi Jinping could be intimidated, but I guess he can. <laughs> he's going to be there. Well, he's got problems in Hong Kong. Right. He's got to yes, he shore does. up his situation. 
you know, problems in Hong Kong mean problems at home. And I think there's, you know, the Tiananmen issue a couple of weeks ago is probably affecting his power in China. Um, so he's going to be there. You know? and so Trump presumably is going to have a one-on-one -on -one with him, which is interesting because, because the G20 is supposed to be multi multilateral conversation, multilateral agreements, but Trump goes there to do bilateral, one-on-one. -on -one. Um, he's, it's the wrong meeting for him, really. But he's going to try to meet with Xi Jinping. What do you think will happen? Well, the cult, the power of Donald Trump's personality will not prevail. And that's the way, and that's the reason why he tries to do bilateral meetings. Because he thinks it's my dazzling personality that will change the day, win the negotiation, and then I get to proclaim it. It hasn't, it hasn't worked yet, has it? In Donald Trump's mind, it has. Yeah, well, My great, beautiful love letters from Kim Jong Un. Well, that you know, Kim He's Jong Un not is sorry, not going to be. I'm getting love letters. Are you? <laughs> I, I don't want to. <laughs> Kim Jong Un is not going to be at the G20, which is really interesting. Yeah. So, exactly what is the status of that? And Xi Jinping is going, or is there now, in North Korea, you know, improving his own relationship uh, with um, with Kim Jong Un, and recently met with uh, 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 what's his name, uh, Putin. Putin. So, uh, you know, what he's forming up alliances and we're destroying alliances. We're isolating ourselves. This is, this is a, a foreign policy defined by isolation. Well, maybe that's the answer to your question. Why is he going to the G20? Um, yeah, to form more and more relationships and more alliances. China. Oh, yeah, China. That's why yeah. China would go. Yeah. Yeah. That's why China would go, to show yeah. leadership. Yeah, not because Donald Trump intimidated him. He's got other reasons. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And why would Donald Trump go? Because he wants to be a big guy, and he wants to, you know, have his name, and he wants to create some con consternation there. Um, that's why he would go, not to achieve anything, because he cannot. Well, I think know. he wants to sit down with Putin without anybody listening and no note takers in the room, just like last time. So yeah. nobody's going to know what they've talked about. Maybe they can talk about the uh, the cyber uh, command's attack on the grid. Ooh. And Maybe. Be interesting. I wish I was a fly <laughs> on the wall for that one. <laughs> I don't think they'll talk about it. <laughs> so what you have is a failed, a failed yeah. foreign policy. I mean, Europe is, Europe is in deep trouble. Italy is like thinking about leaving the EU. Um, there, and Italy has big economic problems. Uh, and all of the EU is in, is in turmoil. Britain, mm -hmm. obviously, is yeah. in total turmoil. Music uh, to Putin's and, ears. Putin right. loves it. Yeah, this is exactly what Putin wants. Exactly. Putin mm -hmm. wants to see, um, you know, for example, um, there's a big thing going on now in, uh, in Congress and elsewhere about, uh, about reparations to the African-American community. Right. Putin would love to see that. Everybody's arguing about it. Yeah. Um, and there's a big attack on Biden because Biden, uh, you know, has a, has a tolerant, had uh, years ago, a, a tolerance of segregation guys in, in the Senate. Um, Putin would love to see that. Let's bring him down. Everybody fight with everybody now, especially the Democrats. Fight, 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 fight. Yep. And so at the end of the day, there's nobody left standing except... My yep. useful idiot, Donald Trump. Yeah. Right. That's, that's very worrisome. Yes, uh, so uh, foreign policy, you know, if you see what he does in foreign policy, it, it is instructive about what he is doing in domestic policy. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing. I'm right. king. And I make div div divisiveness, divisiveness all over mm -hmm. town. Right. And I don't make alliances. I bust people. I bust their chops everywhere in every direction. I, I ruin things. That's what I do. I'm the spoiler for everything. So, so let's go to the 25th Amendment. This is nuts. <laughs> yeah. This is beyond nuts. <laughs> and when I heard that, again, Nancy Pelosi says, if the Senate won't pass it, I'm not going forward with impeachment. That's just crazy. At least an impeachment inquiry, if not impeachment. So that it opens up the ability to investigate. Because just like Hope Hicks comes in and 155 times gets told, I object, or you can't answer that. 155 times in the time that she was there. And she had two of her own lawyers, two White House lawyers, and a lawyer from the... Um, from. Uh, Attorney General's office, and I think, what? Why did she need all there those other guys? There's a lot really anyways. bad legal advice altogether now. Oh. Well, and then this other guy today, what's his name? Uh, didn't show up for his uh, Trump's ex business partner. Didn't show up for his. Oh, but I'll come next time if you just you don't have to subpoena me. 
No, they're just going to drag it out, drag it out, drag well, it out, drag it out. What you see is an emerging pattern of, yes. of, of dysfunction from all three houses of government. Right. All, I mean, all three branches of government. Yeah. He's dysfunctional. Don't forget that. Um, he's made the, uh, the Senate and therefore the, the Congress dysfunctional. <clears throat> and, you know, the Democrats have not been able to recover. Sorry. <clears throat> Nancy could be doing something, but she's not. Um, and then finally, the, the courts. He's 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 seated the courts with conservatives, and they are taking root now. Mm -hmm. uh, hundred and seventy of them. I yeah. looked it up. But you wait before we go any further. You just coughed. You might have to leave. Sorry. Did you see that this last week when oh. somebody coughed Mul when he was Mul doing Mul an interview? Mulvaney. Mulvaney, Mulvaney coughed. coughed, and he made Mulvaney <laughs> leave. He made him stop the interview and say, "Oh, you can't cough. Oh, I can't believe he did that." You've got to leave. If you're going to cough, get out. And he made him retape that part of the interview. With ABC. Yeah. in the room. George Stephanopoulos. George again. Stephanopoulos was it's, in there. It's getting worse. He's it dumping is. on all our institutions. So, <laughs> yes. Nancy, you got to get, you got to do well, everything please, that's right. Nancy. you got to get but rid look of at the numbers. Man. Look at the numbers. It was only two and a half, three weeks ago. We had 60 that were in favor of impeachment. Then it went, you know. About 72. Yeah. 73 if you count the one so, Republican. So, I mean, the numbers are growing. The numbers are growing, but I, I still think that she's able to stop it, right? And that's the problem. She's, yeah. I don't know what she's waiting for. Gordeaux, maybe. And speaking of Gordeaux, we had this conversation before. <laughs> what about south of the border? Our last topic today. Oh. Where are we? We should never, we here at Trump, we should never forget from week to week the, the Michigas that happened last week. So what's happened this week about the south of the border? It's Six not kids easy. have died. I saw an interview um, by a reporter who had been down there doing an investigation, and he found he interviewed two kids, one 10 and one 15, that were caring for a sick two-year-old because there was nobody else to take care of the two-year-old. Wow. Basic necessities. That's been well documented. Toothbrushes. Yeah. They don't get toothbrushes. They don't, they don't get a lot they of things. They don't get soap. Yeah. Yeah. They just stay in a cage. Yeah. yeah. And by the way, they're not cages. That has been def the administration's position. Of Homeland Security is they're not cages. They're, they're, you know, they're holding and or whatever detention is that, what centers. Detention centers. Detention yeah, centers. Like In fact, um, you know, the Homeland Security chief, Mark Morgan, just said, well, we're not mass deporting you know, millions of people. It'll be 200, 2,000 families. So he was able to put a finite number on the actual deportions they're aiming at rather than Trump's millions of deportations right so the millions is to strike nothing more than fear in the hearts of people and you know make them feel really quite quite ill right. yeah and, and the census question is going to come up pretty soon yeah in right. the supreme court that's really going to be the bellwether the canary in the mine see what happens that will be I'm not optimistic because they haven't the two appointees from trump have not followed in lockstep with him on no, some decisions. I, I know and where so, Kavanaugh is going. Well, I guess time will tell. That's what everyone said on these other prior decisions. Yeah, and we'll Kavanaugh see. did not follow lockstep. Well, I think what Kavanaugh is doing is he's trying to look balanced. But, but when uh, Roe v. Wade comes up, you know, you know what's going to happen. Oh, yeah. So let's talk about optimism before we close here. How, you know, I talk to people on the street. Some people are here in this town. They're singing the Trump song, I'm telling you. And they got all of the points worked out. Uh, and you, you raise the subject, and they give you exactly what his arguments are, too. Um, and you don't want to get into an argument, because you're not going to change anything shouting on the street corner. But, but what, about, what about you? How do you feel a level of confidence in him at all? Do you think that he might change? Do you, do you, feel, do you feel a level of um, optimism for the future? Well... <laughs> Not in, in regard to him, no, I don't think he will change. I, the only way I think he's going to change is to get worse. I think the more freedom he's allowed, the worse he's going to get, the more dictator-like he's going to get, and all of that. The only thing that I heard that was making me feel a little optimistic, because you know me, I'm always screaming about election security. That's the thing we all should be screaming about at the top of our lungs. That's so what can, Mueller said. So we can make it happen. Exactly. Thank you. But I did hear Chuck Schumer say this week that he is going to do everything he can to push forward those four 
bills for election security. So one of them has got to be able to be palatable by at least enough Republicans that we can get something through so we can start moving forward with election security, because as it stands right now, there is none. You think it's going to happen in Congress on election security? No. I don't either. <laughs> I don't. There's no reason why it shouldn't. But Mitch McConnell won't. could have brought those four bills on the floor long ago, and he has actually stated, I'm not doing that. Right. Yes. So what's your level of uh, optimism then? For this administration and this president, zero to none. Optimism for the, the, the opponents of this administration, it stays strong. I think the story will be told, whether there's an impeachment or not, the story will be told of how this country was elected this man, and he would, they, this man sold the American public a bill of goods that, one, hasn't been fulfilled, and two, the behavior and the, the, the aberrant behavior of this president is not something we want to see in the future. And I think that story will be told, and I think those who are on the fence, or even Republicans, who are looking for a candidate to pick other than Trump, will do so. If that candidate and if that story is told in such a way that it's palatable to those Republicans and independents. That's my optimism. From your lips to God's ears. Yeah, Tim Apicella, <laughs> Cynthia Sinclair, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Jay. Thank you, Jay. See you next week. Next week. Aloha. Aloha. Next week.